go to the markets. Let's have a look what's going on. I see red ink. At, uh, right now, I see red ink. Uh, down 60 on the Dow, down 62 on the Nasdaq. That's where we are. David Barnson, the aforementioned, is with me now. For the full hour, no less. I've got a question here. Does Wall Street really care about this survey so that the consumer is tapped out? Wall Street does not, and I do not. And I want to explain why real quickly. It is totally untrue that the consumer is the engine of economic growth. The consumer is the result of economic growth. Economic growth comes from production. You produce goods and services, and guess what consumers do? They like it. They consume, they travel, they eat, they vacation, they do all the things consumers do. This idea that consumers don't want have an appetite to do things has never been true. What happens is they lose credit. They lose access to the ability to consume. But I don't think the consumer is slowing down, and Wall Street really wants to to see production more than consumption. You don't think the consumer is slowing down? Um, it isn't yet. Now, the issue is whether or not it's about to, right. but consumer surveys are lagging indicators, not leading indicators. And then we've got America, he's often called America's top banker, Jamie Dimon. Yeah. He says it would be, and I'm quoting now, yeah. a huge mistake uh, to think that the economy is going to boom. There's so many risks out there. Where do you stand on that? I think he's exactly right. The idea that it will always stay in a boom, this notion that we could never have economic setbacks, he's, it, it, it's never been true. E economies move in cycles, Stuart, and we will certainly have other slowdowns. Right now we're in a very muted period, and we have been for a while. It's muted economic growth. You're answering questions in a very succinct and dramatic and clear fashion, David. That's why you had me on. Uh, for the entire hour? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lot to say, and you're going to say, what more for you? The House, well, you know, it is back yeah. in session today. Speaker McCarthy's got to juggle between avoiding a government shutdown, maybe, and launching an impeachment inquiry into the president. Some on the hard right want the impeachment inquiry in exchange for the, passing the spending bill. Where do you stand on this? There's a lot of people that like to fundraise off of this stuff. And you use the word in your intro that we get ready for annoying headlines and stories. And I got to say, that's really what I think it is. It's annoying. It's not a market story. You know, the market was up eight out of the last 11 government shutdowns. The markets know these things always get settled. The question is, who gets embarrassed in the end? And guess what? Yep. The answer is always Republicans. That's I think that's true. Yeah. No matter what, it, what the stakes are, no matter what the case... Or who's president. Or who is president, yeah. the, the Republicans will get the blame. But, uh, you know, I, I think I'm right to say that as far as everybody else is concerned, the voters, the voting public, it's just annoying. It's annoying. It's, uh, it, it, it's now, at this point, just noise. But it gives local congressional people ability to raise money off of the things they're doing and trying to be as performative as they can be. You're not worried about a government shutdown? Not, not even a little bit. doesn't matter to the markets? Uh, not even a little bit. <laughs> That's good to hear. All right. It just annoys everybody. It's annoying. That's, That's right. right. Thanks, yeah. David. I need your comment on this administration striking a deal with Iran to swap prisoners. It's a $6 billion worth of funds will be released to the Iranians. Six billion dollars for what? Five hostages. And there, we're being told this six billion dollars won't go to anything nefarious. Uh -huh. Oh, because money's not fungible. You know a little bit about money <laughs> and how that operates. I'm sure the Iranians will use it to, you know, create bike paths in Tehran. Or clean energy. Or clean energy. <laughs> yeah, which is the obsession, which is all they talked about at the G20, which is why China skipped it. Let me get back to Apple. David Bonson's still with me. Hanging on here with me, and I need this guy. What do you make of Apple? Well, look, it's so, a, first of all, you wouldn't buy it, would you? Not, not unless they were to start paying a real dividend, exactly. and they right. do $120 billion of profits a year, and they're not giving them back to shareholders. It's an almost $3 trillion market cap company. And so in your conversation with Ray, what I was thinking is, why is the stock not moving higher with some of these exciting things in the product? Because it's already trading at 30 times earnings. Yeah. 30 times. Okay. It's a, already up 40%, 45% year to date. So it's so fully priced in. And that India growth argument is so odd to me. The average salary in India for workers is U.S. dollars, $350 a month. Are they going to spend four months salary on an iPhone? Probably not. And the high earners in India already have iPhones. So their price points will have to come way down if they're going to get that expansion into markets like India. Fair point. That's why Apple's at 179. Good explanation. Tesla. Well, Tesla added $80 billion to its market cap yesterday after Morgan Stanley said it was an AI play. There's the magic words, aren't they? AI. You don't own Tesla either, do you? No, I no do dividend. not. Look, it's up 122% year to date. It's trading at 78 times earnings. One thing I want to make clear for viewers, it has a beta 
of more than double the market. And what beta means is when the market's up a certain amount, expect Tesla to be up double. And when the market's down, expect it to be down more than double. It moves up and down with the market two times the market level. Tesla's just become a very leveraged play on the stock market. 78 times earnings? 78 times earnings. That's rich and expensive. Yes, it is. Got that one right. Big drop for Oracle after their report. Cloud sales growth slowing. They gave a lackluster sales outlook for this quarter. But again, my prompter says there's a lot of AI potential in Oracle. You're shaking your head. Well, it's just exhausting that people are going to try to get away with saying AI, AI, AI on every analyst call, every bad news, revenues down, business is hurting. Well, we have an AI play. I mean, I'm expecting restaurants to start saying they're an AI story. And we've seen this movie before. We saw it with the cloud. We saw it with with dot com. People want to tie themselves into a certain theme. How are they making more money from something. In Oracle's case, with AI, apparently they're not. Down 11%. That's a huge drop there. Amazon. I think it probably opened a little bit lower. Yes, it did. 84 cents down. But yesterday, I think it closed at the highest level in more than a year. Was that it? Now, again, you don't own this, do you? No. And keep in mind, even with it up 70% this year, it's still down 18% from where it was in 2021. So it was really overpriced. It got clobbered. It has come rallying back. But you thought that Tesla's 78 times was expensive? Yeah. Amazon, 114 times earnings. You're kidding. No, I'm not. The stock, the company is valued 114 times Trailing more earnings. Tra- yes. than, its, uh, than its past earnings. That's right. Profit. So if they don't grow earnings at all, which they will, you'll get your money back in 114 years. Okay. okay, okay. Sarcasm is a low form of wit. You know it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Google, they're on trial in Washington, D.C. The Justice Department alleges that Google harmed consumers by stifling competition. I, I, why is this such an important case? Well, I think that the Justice Department is wrong, but it's important because it weighs on the market. It weighs on what investors can expect. And we saw this in the 90s with Microsoft. Microsoft prevailed in that. After two years, they ended up beating back the Janet Reno Clinton Justice Department. Uh, Both the Trump administration and Biden administration have had issues with Google and antitrust. The idea, though, is that it kind of keeps the stock lingering because investors don't know what will happen. And Google certainly is a very big and powerful company. But these are complex legal arguments. Okay. You always bring with you some uh, dividend picks, and you brought two today. Let's start with Chevron. Well, you know, here it is up this morning. It was down a little yesterday, but I just want to point out oil's back to 87. Chevron's still trading around the same as it was when oil was at 67. Uh, They are trading at 10 times earnings. So these big tech companies, you can pay 40, 50, 80 times. Chevron, you can pay 10 times. And obviously, as the second biggest U.S. uh, producer, both oil, natural gas, there's so many ways they make money. It's an inexpensive way, and you get to collect almost a 4% dividend yield that grows every single year. For almost 4%. Right. Not bad. Yeah. IBM. You keep going back to the well at IBM. You you constantly like this thing. I should point out that it isn't like every time I mention the stock on air, I've rebought it. We just still own it. (laughs) And, you know, I think that uh, when you only own 33 stocks, once I'm on your show 33 times, I have to start going back to the well. Uh, IBM is, look at how it's performed, though. I mean, it's up 15 percent in the past year. And you want to talk about a company that really does have an AI story, that really is invested in artificial intelligence, and it has no valuation being given to it for that that, is IBM. was that Watson? That's well, some, that, that, that's, something that's, to that's do with one AI, of the things they're it? developing. They've done some acquisitions. In the meantime, their cash flow still comes from their old line businesses. And, of course, they bought Red Hat. They're doing a ton with hybrid cloud. And they're trading at a mid-teens multiple. And they have a 4.5% dividend yield that they're growing significantly every single year. Not bad, Thank I would you, say. <laughs> Not bad at all. Yeah. Thanks very much, David. David Barnson with me. Forced transition to electric vehicles. I'm not asking you politically. What about economically? Well, see, economically, we believe in choice. We believe in markets right. where people freely exchange. I'm all for electric vehicles. I love companies producing them and the consumers that want them, buying them. You like competition. You like new technology. But forcing a consumer to buy something is anti-choice. It's anti-market. And it ends up hurting electric vehicle companies, too, because it distorts the marketplace. David, before you leave us, does the market have any concern about an age, aging president seeking re-election. 
I think the markets have concern about the um, unpredictability of it. There's uncertainty that surrounds the whole 2024 election. It looks like the two nominees will be Biden and Trump. It, there's a lot of reason to believe both of them are vulnerable with their own age, legal situation, uh, controversy, and relative unpopularity. But what the markets can't price in, Stuart, is what the Senate and the House will be. You, you can have a, an aging president, but a Republican House, and the markets wouldn't mind that. You could. Got that right. David, thanks for being with us for the hour. We always appreciate that.